Hey guys, Stan Efferding here, founder of The Vertical Diet. We provide a simple, sensible, and sustainable solution to help you reach your health and fitness goals. First, get started with our easy to follow Vertical Diet eBook, which includes a quick start guide and sample menus to customize a diet plan that fits your goals. Second, use the My Vertical Tracker app to help you monitor and maintain your progress. And third, for our busy clients who are always on the go, let us do the cooking for you. Our Vertical Diet meal prep company offers free shipping of your favorite meals delivered to your door in the U.S. and Canada. So head on over to StanEffording.com and get started today. Well, welcome back, everybody, to the Vertical Podcast. Stan Efforting here, founder of The Vertical Diet, and I'm with Damon McCune, my co-author and partner in crime, registered dietitian, exercise phys PhD. And we've got a very special guest today. Probably needs no introduction, uh, but Damon, go ahead and why don't you introduce our guest. Absolutely. Definitely doesn't need any introduction. I, I believe now he is the most cited uh, researcher on muscle hypertrophy in, in the world, uh, which is a huge accomplishment. And congratulations on early tenure, by the way. Um, but we have Dr. Brad Schoenfeld with us today. So Brad, I'll let you go ahead and kind of give the audience a little bit of your background and kind of what you do and how you got there. Yeah, I think what makes me somewhat unique is that I was a uh, personal trainer. I was a practitioner for many years and uh, then went into academia now a little over 10 years ago. Uh, went back for my master's, got my PhD. I'm currently an associate professor at Lehman College in the Bronx. I'm a researcher educator. So I, uh, I, my primary focus on research is muscle hypertrophy, as you said, but I, I do strength performance work as well, as well as body composition. So fat loss is another uh, area in sports supplements. And uh, do a lot of uh, speaking, international speaking. Um, basically, I'm an educator, so I try to make my uh, my work and opinions as available as possible to all that want to listen. That's awesome. We're so glad to have you for that. I, I bumped into you at the NSCA conference, and one of the things I wanted to make sure and, and let you know is first to, to thank you for all that you've done uh, to help all of us, the meatheads, as I'm referring to us, uh, in the industry who've been around for all these years, and didn't have the internet, didn't have access to this kind of information, and you've done such an, uh, an incredible job dispelling a lot of myths uh, and just allowing us to focus on the things that work and to uh, let go of the things that, that really don't have much evidence that, that, that they work. So today I kind of wanted to go down some of that. I like to give our viewers takeaways, things they can implement right out of the, the gate. And a lot of the people that, that I work with, it, it, I know – Folks think I work with just a lot of athletes. The fact of the matter is the vast majority of our followers now uh, and the people that, that we communicate with on a daily basis uh, are busy people, just dad bods and soccer moms trying to, to find their inner athlete and get the best physique and the best return on their investment. And so we want to talk about today to kick off is really uh, the difference between exercise versus training. A lot of people go to the gym and they, and they, and they move and I'm a big proponent of movement. I've always said the best exercise is the one you'll do. But after that, getting the best benefit from it is pretty important. So what we want to find out is when somebody goes to the gym, uh, primarily with the intention of building muscle, not necessarily just to burn calories, what kinds of things should they be focusing on for their training, not just exercise? So it's somewhat of a nuanced question because ultimately it depends upon what their, their ultimate goal is. For the vast majority of people, they can do a minimal workout and get and build some muscle. So I, you know, most people that are going to the gym are recreational exercisers that are just looking, hey, I want to want to tone up and I want to lose a little weight. And and for them, a very minimalistic routine, you can get uh, very good results doing a half hour, like a one set to failure two or three days a week and build some appreciable muscle and probably get 50 to plus percent of your genetic potential. Now, my focus in research, and I, obviously you guys, is on optimizing uh, genetic potential. And for those who want to do that, that is a completely different ball game and that's where the nuances come in. So, and this I think is where some of the disconnect is in the industry. So. Uh, Part of the other issue is that most or much of the research has been largely up to this point in untrained individuals who for the first several weeks, if not a couple months, are basically getting neural mechanisms. So there's other, many other factors that differentiate them, certainly from a guy like, like you, Stan, and Damon as well. So uh, is the question then, what can you do to optimize the mass or just so if you can kind of clarify where you're going? Yeah, let's bounce through it. So 
you're past the beginner phase. You've got a little bit of discipline. You're going to the gym consistently. You've gotten your, your neuromuscular uh, adaptation from just coordination, from learning the movements. And you want to get more out of your training. Uh, I kind of got a little list here I'll go down as to some things that might not be optimal that we may have historically thought. One would be like going in and performing a bunch of drop sets. Would that be any better than straight sets in terms of, of a maximum muscle fiber recruitment and the benefits you get for hypertrophy? Do you need to, to do the 80s and then the 60s and then the 40s and the 20s? Is, that's a lot of extra work. Are you getting the extra benefit from that? So, so the research does not support, there's not been a lot of research. I actually have the, interesting, I haven't gotten the data yet, but I'm collaborating on another paper of, we performed one in the past and I have another one that is now in the works. But to date, the research really has not supported a benefit per se to drop sets with the caveat that if you're equating the volume of the drop set with, let's say, just doing the same amount of work spread out over non-drop sets, because really that's the way it's been looked at. Uh, there has not been much of a uh, benefit to it. I would say the benefit, but there hasn't been a detriment either. So the benefit really is that you can probably get the same results in less time. It would be more of a time efficient way to train. However, what has not been studied, and um, at least what would have, I think, a logical rationale is the fact that drop sets would be an efficient way to add more volume without really adding on to the session length. And that potentially can, volume is a driver of hypertrophy, that potentially could be a, a greater driver. So let's say you're doing three sets, and on the last set, you do a drop set uh, where you're basically getting two more sets or however what iteration you'd want percentage of a set uh, that would add on some volume. And that potentially can allow you to get more better results with less time than if you, let's say, did waited two minutes and then did another set uh, that has not been tested. So that is still somewhat a hypothetical on my part. But I, I think the uh, there's reasons you might want to do drops, but there certainly is no clear evidence that it is a superior way to train per se on its own. Okay. Uh, maybe I should have asked this first, but uh, you've talked a lot about the number of effective, uh, the amount of effective reps that you need to do in order to get a hypertrophy response. If you, uh, if you say do 10 reps and you could have done 20, uh, how close to failure do you need to get in order to get the best hypertrophy response? It's a really a great question. And I think as we'll go on with this, you're going to see that most of my I, I will almost always answer kind of it depends because there's no exact, first of all, research is never going to provide you with an exact answer on something like this. And there's so many different ways to, to study topics and to look at them. So I, I'll say this, that there does not seem to be, and I would say that with good confidence, taking all your sets to failure over time is certainly not a good strategy. You're going to end up getting trashed and, and it's a good way to overtrain. Uh, the evidence really is interesting. We have a meta analysis, which is just going into review now. The evidence does not show that training the failure is any more beneficial. So that um, it would seem to debunk the need to train the failure and somewhere within like the one to three RIR repetitions in reserve. So being anywhere between one to two or three reps short of failure would be as effective as failure. Um, I, I am not fully buying that, even though that, certainly the literature says that. Having So this is where you have to use your own uh, personal expertise because an evidence-based approach, you're going to look at what the literature shows, but then you have to take into account your personal expertise. You look at what the gaps are in the literature. Um, I think selectively taking – when you get to a certain level like you guys are at and certainly that I've been at for training many years, uh, I've trained with John Meadows who you probably know, uh, again, a guy who just is, is extremely high level and – People uh, in that realm, I, I think, would benefit to taking at least the last set to failure and perhaps even beyond doing some uh, force reps if necessary. Again, no evidence that I can present you with that, but I think anecdotally from my experience that would uh, show that. And I, I certainly you cannot take from the evidence that we have that there's no benefit to training for, to failure. And I'd also say that one of the issues when we look at research is that you're generally going to compare one versus another in a binary context. So it's every set to failure versus no sets to failure in a given population. It's never been studied. How about doing RIR? Let's say you're doing three sets, RIR of two, RIR of one, and then last set to failure. And where you're really taking it in, where you're going to have better recuperation. Uh, and I, again, we can get, I can really get into the weeds here. 
taking a squat to failure is a lot different than taking a lateral raise to failure in terms of its effects on recuperation. So we also have to look at what type of exercise is being done. Uh, I've never seen anyone who does a set of lateral raises and says, I'm crushed. I don't think I can train anymore. You know, I'm going home. Where you do that with some squats or deadlifts, uh, you're you're going to be in some you know hurting shape probably the next day. Or certainly after the session, it's going to make you suck wind, and certainly will affect your recuperative ability more so than than a single joint movement would. So these are all kind of the nuances that we can. I can give my impression of it. I can tell you what the research shows, and give you kind of my. Uh, my evidence-based impression, but by no means is that a be-all end-all. We still have a lot more work to do to kind of uh, provide, I think, more hard evidence in that respect. You hit on exactly the reason I was kind of chasing this line of questioning, and that is fatigue and recuperation. And yes, you can build just as much muscle doing, uh, getting within a rep of failure with a heavy set of fives, or within a rep of failure with a, a, a medium weight for 8s to 12s, or within a rep of failure doing a lighter set of 20s, as long as you're within a rep of failure. We get similar hypertrophy benefits. But what you mentioned was fatigue and recovery, and those are very different things with the exercise that you do, the rep range that you use, and the uh, type of, uh, and the intensity that you utilize. So if you're trying to plow the path that allows you to train uh, a little more frequently, and recover a little better because what you do in any one workout doesn't determine your, uh, you know, the majority of your results. What you do, what you string together over the course of many weeks or months. What you found in your research, I've seen consistently, is those people who train in the fives or the twenties, or those people who go to failure. You mentioned they build up more fatigue. They have a higher dropout rate. They have a higher injury rate. So, based on that information, what what's kind of the the path for the individual that wants to to be the least sore but still get the most benefit and recover faster so they can do more volume. Yeah, and, and, and you also just touched on another really important point is the rep range. So we did a study, it was actually my doctoral dissertation work, where we looked at basically powerlifting versus bodybuilding styles of training, and we equated the volume. So basically it was three sets of 10 for the bodybuilding and seven sets of three for the powerlifting. Now in research, we generally, or at least I do, I make my uh, subjects train to volitional failure not because I think it's the best way to train, but that basically baselines it so you don't have confounders. Because if you're then saying, well, you're going to stop with one RIR, if the RIR is a very That's soft. <laughs> people who are very good at using it, but people don't have good senses, at least the subjects that we get into the study. And it then throws a confounder in is that how much effort did they have? So if we take them to volitional fatigue, failure, we kind of know where they're stopping. Uh, the interesting thing was there was no differences in growth. It was an eight-week study. The caveat to that is that the power lifters were trashed. By, so two of them dropped out. Every To a man, every subject in that powerlifting group said they were had sore joints. Several of them just had trouble completing the last few workouts because of back issues. And uh, So the lower the point that I'm making here is that when you're training with heavier loads, I think going to failure becomes even a bigger issue in that uh, – not going to failure, let's say in your five, one to five range, three to five, whatever you're talking in that, would be really you want to stop at least a rep or so short of failure in that. So when you start getting to 10 reps, um, you, there's less, and we, we didn't find much of that there, there's less of an issue with that. Uh, but again, it's somewhat exercise dependent. When you get to like the 20 plus rep range, when you're getting into the very high rep ranges, you need to get closer to failure, if not to failure, to achieve the same muscle hypertrophy benefits. At least that's what our research has been showing. And uh, what I will say is that the early phases of that are brutal on uh, subjects. I mean, puking, like I, I carried out a study where we did 10 reps versus 30 reps to failure. And the 30 rep subjects, especially in the leg exercises, were puking. I mean, over half puked <laughs> for the first week. Uh, so your body adapts metabolically over a while, and it's less onerous. But this is why a lot to to piece together there. I will say that there's a lot of inter-individual variability as far as that goes. Uh, certainly for the average guy who's been training a few years or is, isn't as serious, uh, let's say he's trained per se but not highly trained, I think the need to really go to failure is diminished there. I think, uh, again, as you start getting more and more more closer to your genetic ceiling, the more important it is to uh, 
at least have a set or so uh, where you're training to failure on some of your sets because you're, you're really looking to, uh, to push that envelope in a way to, to go beyond the adaptation point. You know, certainly, you, we, we know you get to that genetic ceiling and to adapt takes more and more work and more and more ingenuity. And that's one of the ways to go about it. Yeah, you know, I was a big proponent of the 20s there for a while because that's the way I trained with Flex Wheeler. But I had 20 years of lifting experience. I was performance enhancing drugs. I was just eating, sleeping and training. And so I was able to recover from that workload. But when I started introducing that to, to my audience uh, in the years that the subsequent years, I found that, that they were getting crushed. And so I had to be cautious, maybe just do a limited amount of that volume. But one question I had with respect to the 20s, uh, and, and maybe the comparison between uh, doing continuous reps and what we would call rest pause. So maybe I can only do 14 reps at 315 pounds on the squat. And before I, I've, I've reached potentially within a rep or so of failure. But if I stop and I take a couple breaths, I can do two more. And I take a couple more breaths, I can do two more. Am I getting any additional hypertrophy benefit from doing the rest pauses as compared to just going until muscle failure or, or maximum muscle fiber recruitment? Yeah, it's another interesting topic. And the literature to this point does not show a benefit to it, um, but it doesn't show a detriment. And again, you're able to get, it doesn't show when volume is equated. So a lot of times we're looking is it effective on its own when you're, let's say, is there anything special about just rest pausing versus doing more sets? So the, the, it depends what you're equating it to. I would, again, as with drop sets, say it could be a way to get more volume, as you kind of alluded to. And volume's a driver of hypertrophy, at least up to a certain point it is. And I think there is a, a rationale where, where rest, rest pause can be utilized, similarly with drop sets to uh, add on volume without um, kind of getting that fatigue fitness, uh, trying to get in your fatigue, fatigue fitness um, zone properly so that you're not overdoing it but allowing the greater volume. On that, in that same topic, how about the one minute rest periods? You go in and you, you, or even 30 seconds, you do a set of dips, rest for 30 seconds, do a set of dips. Are you better off in terms of hypertrophy response waiting the two minutes before you do another set of dips? Are you other things failing other than just mechanical tension? Yeah, so the, the literature is starting to be somewhat clear on that and that uh, you are better with the greater longer rest somewhere in that two minutes plus rest versus doing the one minute. And the reason seems to be that you reduce your volume load. You reduce, when you're taking these short rests, you have to reduce, like you said, the mechanical weight that you're using and thus reducing the mechanical tension for that set. Uh, we have a paper that uh, should be coming out shortly where really interesting findings and I think speaks to this, where one group did, it was, it was within subject, where both legs did the same, uh, the same person did one, let's say, three minutes rest on one leg and one minute rest on the other. Uh, so one of them did just three minutes versus one minute, three sets, and there was better results in the three minutes rest versus one minute rest. The other group, we then added on more sets to the leg that was doing the short rest to equate with the number of, with the amount of load that was used in the three minute rest. No differences in hypertrophy. So it's showing, at least what the, this study showed, was that the, um, the reduction in volume load was really the driver, what was impairing hypertrophy with the short rest. Then you gotta say is, uh, is the longer time spent in the gym worth it versus taking the shorter rest I think they kind of even out at the end. Uh, so it was the metabolic fatigue that you're getting. I think then you have to look more at long-term recovery, how they might, the shorter rest versus longer rest might affect you. Yeah. Last question on this topic. I'll let, uh, I'm, I'm hogging the mic as I usually do. I'll let Damon jump in because he's got a lot of stuff he'd like to cover. The reason I got into this whole topic of exercise versus training is primarily because a lot of the women that I train historically for many years, they would always want to come in and do a whole lot of more sets and reps and volume and rarely get to failure and 30-second uh, rest periods and battle ropes and a bunch of, you know, just running around the gym because they looked at it more as an opportunity to burn calories. And they looked at, at if, they, if they were sweating and they were exhausted at the end of that workout, they felt as though that might be the driver of body composition change. And I wanted to try and differentiate between 
building muscle and losing body fat and get them to focus on diet for the body fat, as we know that exercise isn't, isn't the greatest way to, 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 you know, in general, isn't the greatest way just to lose fat, the, the, the diet's more important. So how do you design those programs or, or explain to them where to prioritize their efforts in terms of, uh, of uh, those two different, very different uh, paths that they need to take as, a, as somebody trying to improve body composition and get lean? Yeah, so first of all, I completely agree that you need to separate. Resistance training should not be a cardio session. If you want to do cardio, if you want to do exercise for fat loss, focus on your cardio for just burning from a burning calorie standpoint. That's what your goal is. And that your resistance training should be focused on a specific goal, either strength or hypertrophy or muscle endurance, not on fat burning. You're going to certainly burn some fat just through the course of the, the exercise itself, as well as some of the post-exercise effects through primarily protein synthesis, which is an energy intensive process. But uh, and a couple interesting things here, women do have, this has been I think quite nicely shown in the literature, they have better rec interset recovery. So they can actually, yeah. with shorter rest intervals, it might be because the loads they use are lower to start with so that they're, it's not as taxing. That's one of the theories at least, but you generally can shorten rest intervals with women to a greater extent than you, than you can with men without having detrimental effects, and that's number one. But as far as your question, I think that it comes down to education, and that to me, the way I've always approached, and I certainly I'm currently working with a bikini competitor now and have had this conversation, is that we focus on uh, the resistance training for your hypertrophy, your sculpting, whatever you want to call it. And for me, the primary focus of uh, body fat loss should be diet. Uh, I don't even introduce uh, aerobic exercise from a fat loss standpoint until it's absolutely necessary. And particularly as you're starting to come down in calories, when you're doing a lot of exercise, your predisposition to overtraining and non-functional overreaching becomes higher. So I, I don't think it's necessary. I think you get more bang for your buck through uh, doing, doing it through nutrition. Now sometimes, perhaps sometimes often, Times towards the end, the very end of competition, when you're getting into low body fat, you need some cardio to supplement. But uh, I, I think that that is, to me, more the last resort after you've exhausted your work uh, abilities, your, your uh, strategies. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so this might be kind of beating a dead horse, but let's just back up for those out there that are in our our audience that you know maybe they're really new to training. Uh, and, and maybe they really like going to say an orange theory, or they really like going to a body pump class, you know, from, from our standpoint, that's kind of the, the exercise and that's more of a cardiovascular workout, even though they may have them move around some weights kind of, how, how do you define resistance training to people that are not really familiar with the industry? Uh, and by the way, that's fine. If for me, the 80% or whatever, 70% of the population is almost completely sedentary. So anything that gets them out. Oh, I yeah, agreed. Yeah. <laughs> theory or whatever. But yeah, they're, the benefits that they're going to be getting are minimal as far as strength and hypertrophy and probably even muscular endurance because they're just not, they'll get probably more in the muscle endurance realm, but they're still not taking their muscles to a point of fatigue where they're building up a lot of lactate, lactic acid. As far as I know, I've never never taken an orange theory class. So, uh, <laughs> I didn't say what goes on there. But a resistance training, I, I mean, in uh, the operational definition would be moving a, uh, a resistance. Um, uh, would be moving, basically that would be it. It would be moving a resistance. Now it could be body weight. It could be uh, free weights. It could be a machine. It could be, iso there's different, iso you can have isometric uh, actions, concentric, which is, uh, pushing against gravity, eccentric, which is a lengthening action, which is going with gravity. So um, now there's many different, uh, as you kind of touched on, but many different ways you can go about using it for different adaptations. Uh, for me, the pr three primary ones should be strength, hypertrophy, and, and muscle endurance. And I think that kind of leads into a little bit, um, you know, lately you've had some really good posts on exercise variety. Um, and the concept of, of muscle confusion. And I, I think all of us in the industry, you know, the muscle confusion thing, we're kind of over that, but the, there seems to be something there with the variety. So can you kind of talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so our study, we took uh, two groups of subjects. One of them did a very straight routine, didn't change much. Basically, they had a, some mild changes in the rep ranges. They went from uh, 12 to 10 to 8, I believe it was. 
Uh, but other than that, and it was structured. So 12 reps for uh, two weeks and then I think 12, 10, 8, and 6. The other group uh, had their exercises uh, varied through a random application. It was a f uh, phone app. And at the end of the study, we actually found slight decreases, or, or not decreases, but a slight blunting of muscle hypertrophy. But both of them did get bigger and stronger, but there was less of, the gains were somewhat less. They were modestly less in the group that had their exercises randomly varied. Uh, however, we also did a motivational uh, survey, and the group that had them varied, had the exercises varied, had much greater motivation, significantly greater motivation throughout the routine than those who were given the standard routine. I'd also say that, again, when we do a research study, we're kind of looking at polar opposites. So we're looking at complete random variation here versus a group that was very structured and had a, an exact routine. I think there is a middle ground variety to me I think can be used to promote greater hypertrophy. Uh, I think if it's done intelligently, like not you know, random variation to me would never, anything random in a workout other than maybe for uh, motivation doesn't make sense. It's, uh, it's not systematic. It's not the way scientists would think and thus exercise as a science. But um, I, I think the, my, my general strategy on variety is to keep you more complex movements uh, so more of the free weight, multi-joint free weight exercises as regular parts of a routine and then vary in your single joint, your machine type exercises. And the theory there is that, uh, first of all, the, the theory is that novelty in itself can be a stimulus for growth potentially. Uh, it's not muscle confusion per se, but it's just working fibers in ways that they're, they haven't, it's not confusing the muscle, it's just working them in ways that they're not used to working. Right. But... <laughs> If you do, a, let's say you do a squat now and then you don't do it again for three months, you're going to have a pretty shitty squat in three months. Whereas if you do a, uh, let's say, a cable crossover today and you don't do it again for three months, I could do a perfect cable crossover in three months without any degradation. So, you know, varying in, let's say, a dumbbell fly with a cable crossover with a for, for your um, single joint chest exercise with maybe a pec fly, machine pec fly, while keeping your bench press is a more viable strategy because you're allowing the motor patterns to be maintained in the more complex moves and then allowing variety to, if it does have effects, and that's still questionable, but I think there's a good logical rationale for it, uh, that that will ultimately uh, optimize your results and also keep it interesting. Yeah, and I appreciate your your pragmatic approach to that. I think you, you've done a really good job too, especially on your social media of talking about the difference between you know literature and data that is uh, statistically significant versus something that's physiologically meaningful, because um, because that's a, a little bit of a gray area in, in, out there. And I think that there's a lot of practitioners that don't necessarily take the time, like you talked about earlier, of, of really harnessing their experience to really appropriately translate some of that data. So I thank you for all that. Well, thank you. And that's a big hobby horse of mine at this point. Um, the statistical, the inability to properly interpret statistics for the practical application, I think is the big disconnect in the field. So we can yeah. look at something that's statistically significant, as you said, it doesn't mean it's practically meaningful and vice versa. Just because there wasn't a statistically significant finding doesn't mean there might not be practically meaningful interpretations that you can take out of a paper, out of a study. And, and in particular, the vast majority of training studies have low sample sizes. It's just very, it's very time consuming, difficult to get uh, sufficient statistical power. So uh, you can really, if you're looking at the nuances of a study, uh, you can often uh, see, and especially a, what I like to suggest is take a look at some of the graphs. They can be more, uh, graphs can be more telling than a lot of these statistics themselves in terms of what the practical inferences may be. Absolutely. You know, obviously we're big proponents of weight training and uh, we recommend that people lift weights. They lift with a reasonable amount of intensity and frequency to get results ongoing. Um, I think that was Mike Israel told that Mike said you can lift long or you can lift hard, but you can't do both, or you can lift about as long and as hard as, as that from which you can recover, right. and that kind of transitions me into the recovery. And you said something that was interesting in, in uh, just recently here. You said uh, about a blunting effect. So now you've invested all this time and energy into training, 
and you need to recover. So what types of things are probably going to going to uh, inhibit that recovery? What do you watch out for? And then well, what will optimize it, obviously, is the second phase of that question. Yeah, so one of my uh, real interests, so we know that the resistance training volume is a driver of hypertrophy. That's pretty clearly shown in the literature. But we also know that the human body is very resilient and can recover quite well over short periods of time when imposed a very high amounts of stress. So if you're looking at exercise itself as a stress and volume would, uh, the dose response would be greater stress, the greater dose would be greater stresses. Um, at what point is there a limit to how much volume you can tolerate and for how long? And one of my, an area that I'd like to study, it's a difficult study to carry out just because logistically uh, there'd be problems. But my theory has been, and I've certainly used this with um, a lot of high-level competitors, is to vary volume, to periodize volume in cycles over time. So you have a period of lower volume going to a period of moderate volume and then a period of higher volume and then having a active recovery, short active recovery phase and repeating this cycle. Now, each person is going to have different volume needs, different recovery needs. So the, uh, the length of the cycles can be shorter or longer. It's no cookie cutter template that I can ever give for any of these things. But uh, I've used variations of this uh, frequently now with many high level competitors and found it to be quite effective. There's nothing in the literature that has ever been studied in this realm, uh, but it's one of the gaps in the literature. When we look at volume studies, we're generally looking at a short period of time or, or even for a longer period of time, and then you don't have variations as to how that could have been structured. So we're looking at either one, again, binary choices, six months of doing one thing, six months of doing another, eight weeks of doing one, eight weeks of doing another. How about four weeks low, four weeks moderate, four weeks high volume, then having active recovery and repeating? six weeks, whatever it is. These are ways to me or, or a, uh, a solution, a, st a strategical solution for optimizing recovery, optimizing the dose response relationship without, um, without devolving into an overtrained state. So that to me is a uh, very important or potentially important strategy that I've used. Just to really quick tease that out a little bit, when you talk about high, medium, and low, let's say somebody's doing 15 working sets a week for chest. Mm -hmm. That I would consider, let's say that's their top. So let, that would be their high volume. Would their low volume then be just a third of that, like the five sets? Or how would you kind of quantify it? Yeah, so um, it's somewhat intuitive. Um, I, I will say this too, that my, my opinion on that topic also is somewhat morphed over time, especially some of the recent research where I don't, Look at volume is that you need to do a certain amount per uh, per muscle group. I, well, I okay. do, but in the sense that it should be focused on your lagging, what, what muscle groups are lagging and which are stronger. There's no reason to spend volume. I kind of look at it as a budget that you have for volume. Let's say you might do 100 sets a week for your whole body. Uh, how much of that is going to be allocated to your weak thighs versus your strong biceps? You might do five sets a week for biceps, even at your high if that's a, uh, a strong point where you're doing up to 20 or so. So I think that's another nuance that needs to be factored in. Um, usually I'd look at uh, something like what you said, but kind of like the 10 to 20 rep range, uh, set range per muscle per week is, is a general guideline. So let's say it's uh, for uh, on average 10 sets, 15 sets, 20 sets at your high. You just kind of scale that back. Uh, so it's roughly a, a quarter reduction uh, quarter or a quarter increase, 25% increase in volume each each time, roughly. So you just go decrease, correct. If 15 is your high, you'd go maybe to 11 and then maybe to 7 or 8, somewhere in there. Gotcha. Okay. So you're talking about periodizing volume and that's, and, and you've got a, uh, uh, you've kind of designed that uh, to be um, I think more effective than what we historically would just say, do a deload every now and then. If you're trained really, really hard for four to six weeks, it's probably a good idea to spend a week doing about half the weight and half the volume just to rest the body. Is that a, a similar? Too. That's not, that's uh, deloads are factored in there as well, even with the lower volume, because yeah. you're not training. It's not like you're low volume. You're still training hard. Uh, right. Like I said, last set, you're pushing the failures every four to six weeks. I integrate a deload regardless. So the deload then would be the transition into the next volume phase. 
Okay, so it's two completely different uh, philosophies there, or, or actually they're both important to Correct. do both the deload and to periodize the volume. What we've always found is that the deloads, if you didn't take them, they were historically, they were kind of forced upon you because at one point you'd either get injured or sick and you'd end up resting anyhow. So we figured we might as well just do it voluntarily instead of involuntarily. Yeah, but I, so my point here is that even with a deload, if you're doing very high volumes over the time, in my opinion, and based on my experience, a deload is not enough to completely refresh you and say, all right, I'm ready to go back. Let's say I'm at my upper level of volume. I'm just going to hop back in and do another cycle of very high volume. Uh, in my, from my experience, that's a way that you end up crushing someone. Uh, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So now, how about some of the, say, passive recovery? So somebody trains and then they want to see, is there some, something I can use to recover better? Can I, does a massage help? Does ice help? Does cryotherapy help? Does foam rolling help? Does taking non and inflammatories help? Does any of that help? And maybe that's two completely different uh, things that I've just introduced there. But talk through what can you do to recover better and which things are beneficial, which things might actually hurt your progress? Well, I'll kind of go through each of the ones you talked about and most of them. Um, massage therapy has quite good... Um, well, it has some good evidence. Now, it's hard to placebo a massage, but it's going to make you feel better, which tends to help you recover. Uh, I actually recently got one of those massage guns. It works really good. Uh, I don't know if you've seen them where basically it looks like a drill and it has little massage attachments, and you can actually massage yourself with them. But going for a therapeutic massage certainly it would be a benefit, and there's really no detriment to it. Um, cryotherapy and specifically cold water immersion, they're kind of there's different, but they have similar attributes. Um, it has actually been shown that it is detrimental. And the evidence is now really becoming quite compelling that uh, it has it reduces anabolism. So uh, it is not good if your goal is maximal hypertrophy, uh, taking frequent uh, cold water baths, ice baths is not a good thing. It might be due to blood flow. They're not sure mechanistically why, but reductions in blood flow might be one of the reasons. Do we oh. distinguish between timing immediately following a workout as compared to the next day? Yeah, no, they don't. Um, generally, it's been shown immediately after the workout. How that would affect the next day is anyone's guess. And um, my general approach in things like this is that until we find out more at this point, if it's not good after the workout, I can't say you can't generalize and say it won't be good the next day, but I'd be hesitant to recommend that given that Perhaps there are latent effects that still would be present. So we talk, <laughs> yeah. we talk about that in terms of like cardio after a workout. You, True. You've, you've created a particular stimulus and you need that acute inflammatory response for the repair to happen. Mm -hmm. So you probably don't want to interfere with that stimulus either with art and uh, ice and, and cryotherapy, but probably not also maybe just a whole bunch of cardio immediately following a hypertrophy session might be something to be best done the next day. Is that... Uh, well, that's certainly that's been shown that uh, separating the cardio as far as possible from your strength session, certainly doing it afterwards has been shown to be better. And generally doing either like morning, evening or the next day, if possible, is the best uh, approach there to reduce any interference effects. Some of that then will depend upon how hard you're doing your cardio. So this is, again, where it's not a, a one size fits all uh, uh, solution I can give here or recommendation. Uh, to touch on your anti-inflammatories, that's another very interesting topic. So it's sh been shown that in elderly people, taking anti-inflammatory drugs actually has a pro-anabolic effect that it enhances, certainly doesn't diminish hypertrophy, and in several cases has been shown to enhance muscle building in elderly subjects. The, it's actually the exact opposite in younger subjects, in younger healthy subjects. And the theory is, is that elderly subjects are chronically inflamed. They have chronic inflammation, which has been shown to have negative effects on muscle growth. So low-grade chronic inflammation is an anti-anabolic um, mediator. So, but the acute anabolic effect has, uh, the acute inflammatory effect has been shown to have pro-anabolic effects. So there, there's an interaction there and your, your NSAIDs will have effects on both. The theory is, is that the reduction in the chronic uh, anti-inflammatory effects of NSAIDs outweigh the negative effects on the acute inflammatory response in elderly people. So they're basically, it's you're here, 
It's kind of like, yeah, I'm up here with uh, chronic inflammation. It's not going to be as big a deal to reduce the acute effect. With your younger subjects, they don't have chronic inflammation. So basically, you're just reducing the acute or blunting the acute effect, which again will blunt the hypertrophic response. So now, when you're talking about doing it, what, like if you have a, uh, a Motrin after a workout, is that going to kill your gains? No. But it's repeatedly using the anti-inflammatories. So if you're feeling, I would say, if anything, if it's a one-shot thing, it's beneficial because that's going to help you get back in the gym the next day. If you had a bad, you know, a little workout where you got sore for whatever reason, take a Motrin if you want so you can train the next day. But just don't make it a habit where that's a recovery strategy for you. We saw the same thing, I think, between healthy individuals and uh, un unhealthy, I could say, with respect to metformin use, that right. it was also causing a blunting of the hypertrophy Correct. effect in yes. the healthy individuals. Correct. Do you take that another step and you see uh, people that come in and they're, they're generally healthy? They, uh, we'll just say they don't have a high C-reactive protein or homocysteine. They don't have a lot of inflammation. They don't have a high blood sugars, that kind of thing. I would presume to, to think that that would uh, indicate somebody with a good body composition and, and, and low inflammation. A lot of those people, I notice, will start supplementing with a host of different anti-inflammatories or blood thinners, really. Uh, high dose omega-3, curcumin, uh, maybe a baby aspirin. And I start to get concerned, well, maybe that healthy individual, that's not beneficial for performance sake. Is that, am I going too far past NSAIDs and into those things, or is, is, that, is it too nuanced? I don't think you're going too far. I certainly don't think, well, there's not good evidence. We just hasn't been well researched to, to give you a good answer from a uh, research-based answer there, but I think logically that does make sense and I would agree. Um, I think the uh, omega-3s are an interesting topic. Uh, they also have beneficial effects on, uh, on cellular sensitivity because they also increase the fluidity of cells. So how, how much is their, let's say, anti-inflammatory effects uh, mediated or, or negated by their positive effects on the ability to make cells more sensitive to insulin? Uh, and thus, uh, as well as other signaling, basically a fluid cell is more um, sensitive in general to, to all signals, cellular signals. I think the uh, interesting thing there is the balance between your omega-6s and your omega-3s. So if you're just way, if you're doing high doses of omega-3s and keeping your omega-6s low, then you might be creating imbalances. And those are things that, again, we don't really have good evidence on to give you a what I would consider a good answer on or intelligent answer. Yeah. How about things that do work for, uh, for recovery from a workout? I've always obviously recommended the 10-minute walk, just active, just moving around, just getting blood flow in general rather. Because I used to, when I was powerlifting and I had a huge squat day on Sunday, I used to just sit around all day Monday and I was sore. But then when I started implementing the three 10-minute recumbent bike sessions as part of my recovery, I seem to be a lot less sore. How important is blood flow and what methods can we use to improve that that don't cause more damage? So again, massage is, is a good one that I mentioned earlier, but uh, active recovery, very important. As you said, that basically stimulates the blood flow throughout the tissues and uh, it uh, enhances the uh, recuperative processes, the remodeling. Uh, another very intriguing area, which is not well researched, but there's emerging research that makes me very uh, curious about it. And certainly, um, I, I'm not fully jumping on the bandwagon, but I think it has good logical basis as well as uh, some evidence now is heat therapy. So uh, using hot packs, they've actually, a recent uh, study was shown that putting on hot packs uh, before a workout actually stimulates anabolism. Uh, now, that's not the recovery. That actually is uh, through... I'm not, I'm not sure how you can separate that out, but there's other research. Uh, another one that was very long-term uh, heat. I think it was like six hours they kept heat pads on these people, but it did again show an enhancement of, of anabolism. So I think that uh, if, if anything, it does not seem to have any negative effects. To me, it all comes down to cost benefit. So if something is a potential good strategy and doesn't have any perceived negative effects, it's something that I recommend trying. If there's now, it could be that there's negative effects that aren't latent, that aren't uh, obvious, that are latent, that aren't obvious at this point. But uh, I think at this point, from just from a logical perspective, I would be 
prone towards recommending uh, heat, especially if you have soreness. Hot bath. That include a, that inc oh, a hot bath sauna be, immediately yeah. following a workout? Exactly. Or it could be a heat pad, hot baths, any type of heat stimulation, which again tends to stimulate blood flow. So that would right. be the logical rationale why it would have potential benefits. You want to jump in on go, You go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I've got all this page of notes. Yeah. <laughs> Damon's the exercise phys PhD, so I'm the one that's, that's uh, enjoying this more, I think. But uh, range of motion in terms of muscle hypertrophy. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm the power lifter. I tried to, do, to move as little as possible. Everything for me was about, uh, you know, just moving as much weight. And it, it was obvious in the fact that my legs always lagged behind. My ass was huge. And I could squat 900 pounds, but when I got on a bodybuilding stage, that was always my weakness. Until I trained with Flex Wheeler in 2008, and, and I was able to put on a significantly more muscle on my quads, even after 20 years of training. And one of the big things that he promoted was a greater range of motion. He also took me off of the heavy low bar back squats for a while. Uh, how important is it that we hang up our ego and and uh, utilize a greater range of motion? What are the best exercises for that in, in legs? So glad you asked that question. We just got a paper a systematic review accepted, which should be out imminently on that topic. Um, there's not as much research on the topic as you'd think. I think we, there were seven, seven studies or eight studies that met inclusion criteria. So there wasn't even enough to do a meta analysis, to try to quantify it from a numerical standpoint. But um, what the literature does show at this point is that yes, there is a benefit to larger ranges of motion. It's interestingly specific to certain muscles as opposed to others. More, more specific in the lower body, you kind of mentioned the quads uh, seem to have a greater effect, but uh, not as much in like the, as the adductor. So there's again, limited uh, research on some of the other muscles, but the quads do seem to have that stronger effect. The upper body, it was somewhat inconclusive. But what I think the important thing to keep in mind, too, is, is that it does not, we always think binary, range of motion or full range versus short range. You can also do some partial ranges of motion, either to work through sticking points. There could be reasons why you might want to focus on a targeted range of motion for a given either working on the muscle or particularly through a strength range to get more mechanical tension throughout a full range. So uh, I'm a big proponent of, of trying to teach. Let's not think, yes, we always do uh, full ranges of motion. So there, certainly there's a benefit. Those who never train through a full range of motion will see a, a detriment to their, to their gains. But I, I also think it's short-sighted to say that every set needs to be taken through a full range of motion because there could be other strategies why partials might be integrated into the routine. And examples of that, like on the leg press to bring the feet in and down, might give you a greater range of motion at the knee uh, as opposed to high and wide and loading, uh, I guess, more of the, the glutes. And well, I think that that's going to change the muscle activation, too. That'll shift more for your adductors. You're going to get more work there when you're going wider. So, yeah, that yeah. also will change other muscle recruitment activation strategies. And it's hard because you can lift twice as much weight when you're high and wide on the leg press. And it, it, when the you weights your, drop, you immediately are, in your mind. You right. <laughs> your glutes are a pretty strong muscle in your adductors as opposed to just the quads. So when you yeah. get the muscles involved, you're able to move more weight. And I noticed that Ben Pikulski was using an angle plate a lot with his athletes so they could uh, get a deeper range of motion. And then more recently, uh, I think there's some good videos of uh, Mike Isretel doing the Smith squat, which, of course, powerlifters have always, uh, you know, said it was an, a movement that you shouldn't do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I found myself after seeing, you know, the development of Mike Isretel's got some really thick quads. And when you watch his range of motion, it kind of reminds me back to Dorian Yates doing um, hack squats. His range of motion was pretty extraordinary. His butt would go all the way down to his heels. And that seems to be a, a pretty key component, barring injury, that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, obviously you pick guys with big legs and you just do what they do. Maybe that's a bad way to, uh, to conduct science. But uh, I just, I, I keep seeing that and that range of motion, particularly in the quads, as you mentioned, something we should hang our ego up for for a while if we're looking for hypertrophy. Well, yeah. So again, if you're a power lifter, you're going to need to back squat on a barbell. <laughs> that's sure. not what your game is. So uh, we have to look, we have to separate out the goals of training for strength and particularly for a, for a given competition, for competitive. Uh, but yeah, I do think that 
Now, look, there's other things that factor into it as well. What is your flexibility? Some people are just not flexible. You have to look at limb length and things like um, like a squat, where some people will start getting knee pain if they're squatting too low because they have long – their femurs are, are longer than their uh, their shanks. So, so other things, considerations always come into play. But as a general rule, I would agree that uh, hypertrophy is not about ego. I always say that, uh, yeah, it's nice to be strong, but I want to look like I'm strong. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They don't know how much you lift on a bodybuilding stage. One of the things I noticed is I have real poor ankle flexibility. And so on that Smith machine, you were able to put your feet in front of the bar and you could sit down a lot deeper without having as much of the knee over the toe. Right. right. So I, I was able to do more, use more, get more recruitment out of that. Yep. And, and it also, yeah. Lower yeah. Back, yeah, your lower back can be taken out of the equation as well. So, you know, it can allow you to get a straighter, uh, vertical plane in, in terms of your torso, whereas with the squat, a lot of people tend to lean forward more, which puts more stress on the lumbar area. So well, that's in, it's important. You mentioned earlier about fatigue being kind of a bucket that you fill from all of your different right. workouts. And if you're hitting your lumbar spine real hard with deadlifts and squats, that systemic fatigue may affect your chest workout and, and your just your general overall recovery. Yep. So uh, that, that's, I guess that's a big consideration as well. Yep. Awesome. Well, we've taken up a ton of your time. I'd, I'd say, you know, at this point, maybe wrap it up for our audience and, and kind of, I know we talked about a lot of all these questions that kind of depends on the person and their goals and their individual structure and, and so on and so forth. But maybe what are your top three things that people should prioritize when they're going into kind of creating their training program? Yeah. So I, you know, I, I know people don't like when I'm kind of equivocating, but that's just the nature of our field. It's there's right. no, uh, what Stan's going to do. I know people go up to Stan. Oh, what do you do? How do you get big? Well, if they did Stan's routine, it doesn't mean they're going to look like Stan. They right. need a routine that's going to be customized to their own recovery and lifestyle and nutrition. Uh, I mean, I'm going to keep it somewhat general and, and say that, number one, have a plan. The most important thing is to be consistent. So if you're just going into the gym and doing that random work, you know, yeah, I'll do a little of this, a little of that. You're, you're setting yourself up to fail. That's number one. Number two, get in tune with your own body. Uh, I think one of the things that people, and this kind of goes with what I was just saying there, is that people, and, and by the way, I fell into this trap when I first started training. I started, this was back in the 90s, kind of says my age here, but um, I, I would go out and find the Flex Magazine and Muscle and Fitness and like Lee Labrada's yep. look at or Rich Gasparri. <laughs> And I would just like copy whatever they're doing. And I made some gains at the beginning, but after a while, it's like, I'm not making the gains that I want. Why? Well, that leads to the second point is that you need to be in tune with your body, uh, learn what you respond to. And don't just because someone else is making gains from something doesn't mean you will. You have to find what works for you. And that's an intuitive thing that happens over time that you need to experiment and uh, don't do things just because people tell you to do them. Uh, I can only provide guide. Research can only provide guidelines. And when we're talking like this, I can only provide general recommendations based on experience for, for the masses, for what works for 80% to 70% of people in general. But there's dispersions amongst the mean even there. And then there's significant dispersions when you get your standard deviations going out from there. So that's number two. And um, number three, I, I think it would be nutrition is that uh, don't neglect the nutritional component uh, the, all the training in the world, if you're not supporting it through your, your diet properly and that number one, if you want to build muscle be healthy, you need a sufficient protein, roughly 1.6, 1.7 grams per kilogram minimum per day. Uh, and also if you're looking to build muscle, yeah, you can recompose, you can do body recomposition where you're losing fat while gaining muscle, particularly at the beginning, but you're going to blunt hypertrophy. If your goal is maximal hypertrophy, you need to support it with calories, energy. So uh, you need to at least be at maintenance. In general, you're going to have to be in a caloric surplus uh, to really see proper hypertrophic gains. And the, the higher up you go, the more important that becomes. Excellent. Excellent. Awesome Great advice. advice. You know, yes. Brad, uh, like I started off saying, you've been a fantastic resource and continue to be a great resource for me. And I want others to be able to have access to your information. Your uh, Instagram posts are extraordinary. Uh, you, you probably get about as much of them as you would out of a out of a college degree in exercise science or better, because it's you you talk about the application of this information. So, where do people find you to get more information? 
Well, they can Google me uh, and they'll come up with the submission hits, but I'm on Instagram. Uh, that's Brad Schoenfeld, PhD. I'm on Twitter. That's Brad Schoenfeld, I think, at Brad Schoenfeld. And then I'm on Facebook, which I'm using less now just because their algorithms suck. And <laughs> it used to be a great platform, but uh, it's not as uh, the utility of it has diminished over time. But uh, they can search for me on, I don't even remember what my my name is on that. But if you just uh, search for me, you'll find me. And I have a and what's your, I do have a Yeah, what's your website? Which is lookgreatnaked.com. Which you can uh, easily find. Awesome. Great. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate it. Great information. My pleasure, guys. Thanks, Brad. Take care. Hey, guys. Stan Efferding here, founder of The Vertical Diet. We provide a simple, sensible, and sustainable solution to help you reach your health and fitness goals. First, get started with our easy-to-follow Vertical Diet ebook, which includes a quick start guide and sample menus to customize a diet plan that fits your goals. Second, Use the My Vertical Tracker app to help you monitor and maintain your progress. And third, for our busy clients who are always on the go, let us do the cooking for you. Our Vertical Diet meal prep company offers free shipping of your favorite meals delivered to your door in the U.S. and Canada. So head on over to StanEffording.com and get started today.